And good evening and welcome to another LUA special edition uh, here for uh, exclusively for YouTube. This isn't a live show, obviously, as you can tell. Uh, but I'm here joined with uh, Kyle Rudin. Uh, how are you doing tonight, Kyle? Doing pretty well, Shane. Yourself? I am uh, doing doing pretty good, too. Just got done with higher level indoctrination uh, this evening. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely happy about that. Uh, but we're coming to you tonight with, uh, like I said, a special edition. Uh, we ca I came across a couple of articles uh, here recently uh, that were uh, definitely worth <laughs> worthy of discussion, which is uh, why we're here tonight. Uh, the website is thegbrief.com. I'm sure most of you haven't heard of that uh, because uh, we haven't either. Uh, but before we before we get into, I guess, analyzing these articles and pointing out just the the pure ridiculousness and insanity, uh, I, I guess it, it might be best to start off with uh, uh, introducing the editor in chief, Matt Heller. Matt Heller is the founder and managing director of Urban Air Creative and editor in chief of the G Brief. The G is for generations, which is why we built this digital destination for boomers and Xers like you to learn more about millennials. He has spent over 15 years in a very exciting career across the spectrum of media, engaging millennials as both an audience and as consumers. He became good at it. Uh, he became good enough at it that people consider him an expert and want, hel want his help understanding and engaging them. Want to learn more? You can follow Matt, which I know you guys don't want to do if you're watching this video, so we'll just kind of skip over that part. Oh, man. So, this guy's not a millennial. Let's see what he has to say. The article is, Why Millennials Aren't Afraid of the Word Socialist. And if this seems to overlap with my last Adventures in Illinois Higher Education article, there's a reason. The, the picture that you see here is the picture that I used in that article, and that's actually where, where I found it. That's how I found this article in the first place. Let's uh, kind of dig into this a little bit. You ready, Kyle? <laughs> I'm ready to rock and roll. Oh, boy. Here we go. Quote, For many of us, when we hear the term socialist, it conjures up an image of the Soviet Union. The Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, which lasted almost 50 years, is still fresh in the memories of baby boomers and Gen Xers. However, the rise in the polls of presidential candidate Bernie Sanders has reopened the conversation on socialism as Senator Sanders publicly identifies as a democratic socialist. Millennials have been flocking toward this candidate in, enor in enormous numbers, and polls show that 36% of millennials aged 18 to 29 have a favorable opinion of socialism. Uh, so automatically there, Kyle, that kind of raised some concerns, although it, it verifies my a priori uh, and a posteriori conclusions from, from being at this at a college campus. 36% uh, of millennials uh, are favor have a favor favorable opinion of socialism. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, I think your AIHE series uh, really kind of demonstrates that. And if you think about <coughs> it, that kind of authoritarian indoctrination has been going on long enough to the fact where an entire generation of presumably voters, I suppose, is what they would be doing once they quote-unquote grow up and become 18 and such, <laughs> um, are essentially making what are at least hypothetically coercively binding political decisions when they go into a booth and you know, scratch something on a piece of paper or pull a lever or push a button. Uh, so yes, once that's been going on long enough, <clears throat> the indoctrination I mean, then the result of all of that would be things like uh, what <clears throat> you just read. And uh, that's kind of where uh, things are going. Indeed, indeed. And we'll kind of, uh, we'll get some, uh, some more information uh, and kind of expand upon that later on. Uh, back to the article, quote, So why do millennials have such a different view of socialism than many of their elders in our country? In order to understand this disparity, it's important to first understand that millennials are talking about something entirely different from those elders. Uh, from those elders, understand as socialism. So, first part here: when millennials talk about socialism, they mean something different than what we think. Like the, the collectivism right there. Uh, quote, to millennials, socialism generally means democratic socialism, which is different from the prior generation's view of socialism as a system where the government controls all business and property. Democratic socialists reject the idea of an all-powerful government bureaucracy. Hey, me too. And, uh, back to the, and, and are primarily focused on taking down what they view as big corporate bureaucracy, wherein all important decisions are made and or influenced by giant corporations. Even socialism and communism are different things. While communism hands all property ownership to the state, socialism gives it to the workers. However, a true communist society has never yet existed, and this often creates a confusion in terms. Though a country like China might identify as communist, its system is actually state-directed capitalism. 
On the other hand, the United States actually has many programs that are socialist in nature and have existed for decades, including Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, fire departments, fire departments, and our highways. Uh, so the, the first thing I want to point out here, Kyle, is that there's, there's this misconception among socialists. And I've, I've had uh, fascist book debates with, with these people before. And uh, they don't see the uh, like corporations and government being hand in hand. Uh, corporations couldn't exist in the form that they are today without government. Uh, so I think that's the first misconception that needs to be clarified. Uh, Kyle, any thoughts on that? Well, of course. There was a meme I saw a while back, and maybe someday I'll, I'll put it up on the blog or otherwise I'll pass it around. But it's essentially where because corporations are created vis-a-vis -vis, uh, state privilege or government privilege, uh, you essentially have one fictional entity creating another fictional entity. And so basically the meme kind of shows these imaginary entities writing each other into existence, kind of, kind, kind of as almost kind of like a fascist kind of relationship almost. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just kind of. I mean, look, I know some people will will claim that there's such a thing as anarcho syndicalism or even the merging of what is I think an oxymoron, which is libertarian socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what. Um, Oh, I, uh, I can't remember the guy's name right offhand, but uh, the anarchist back in the 19th century who uh, had the Liberty Newsletter, uh, that Mr. Tucker. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are some people who think that uh, you can have uh, or you, that private property is somehow bolstering up the government when in fact the opposite is true, especially when you consider argumentation ethics. So I think that's what the author is trying to get at here is more – in, in terms of what um, Benjamin Tucker, that was the individual's name I was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe something more along like what Benjamin Tucker was kind of getting at back in the 19th century. But, I mean, let's be honest, as good as the individual anarchists were in much of their critiques of the state, the main problem is that they didn't really understand economics all that well, even though they knew something that, like, the free market is a good thing and private property is a good thing, but we're not going to fully embrace it because we don't quite <coughs> understand how it works. And remember, this was before... The Austrians came, you know, here stateside. They were still pretty much in Europe at the time. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and the, the second uh, paragraph is interesting too. Uh, communism hands all property ownership to the state. Socialism gives it to the workers. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Is, is that really like? I, I think I'm not really sure that's uh, that's necessarily necessarily accurate. Well, that's that's a syndic. Well, that that's the claim of the syndicalists, right? It's like we're going to yeah, have the a anarcho radical... the anarcho communists. So yeah, uh, yeah so that's... there's a similarity there. So they're they're drawing a distinction where the anarcho communists claim the same thing: give give the power to the workers. So yeah, I don't think that's actually accurate. Well, the so-called well, it's the so-called uh, radical trade unionism. It's it's the uh, worker self-management. That's another term that's also been used by them quite frequently. Uh, but also keep in mind that uh, these are also the same people who uh, in, uh, who coined the term scabs. And there's actually photographs. I think I showed you this actually a while yep, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they were actually these libertarian socialists were initiating violence against the so-called scab, which was basically just a guy who wanted to get back to the factory and do his goddamn job. That he already contracted and, and and voluntarily agreed to. So it kind of begs the question when you're looking at it, these so-called libertarian socialists forcibly beating up a scab uh, who's just trying to fulfill his his you know contract, his business contract, as it were, uh, you know, labor for wages and all of that. It's like, yeah, who's violating the non-aggression principle here? Who's really violating self-ownership? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely uh, definitely a good point. Uh, so let's uh, move forward to this. Uh, though a country like China might identify as communist, it's actually state-directed capitalism. Uh, and I'll provide a, a quote here in a moment. Uh, in the next section, there's something even more atrocious than that. But uh, on the other hand, uh, the United States actually has many programs that are socialist in nature, uh, like Social Security. Kyle, you know all about that. You wrote an article on that, didn't you? Yep, yep. Social. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I think it was titled "Socialist Insecurity: How the Raw Deal Enslaved Americans." And yeah, it's just, I mean, here's the short version. Basically, <clears throat> due to the evils of central banking, basically a very, very long story, very, very short, provided an excuse for the government to basically institutionalize this, uh, this, this program of socialized retirement. So uh, Social Security is, is pretty much the poster boy for this wonderful system of socialized retirement, or so the government would have you believe, 
Uh, but yet, as I discovered from actually looking at the government's own documents, when you quote unquote pay into Social Security, you're actually not paying into anything. What it is is a tax. It's called the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. I think it is tax. It's, it is the FICA taxes are taxes. Mm -hmm. Much like income tax, much like sales tax, much like, you know, pick a tax. It is a tax. You're not paying into anything. And the so-called payouts that the, uh, that the hapless retirees get, those are the OASDI payouts. Uh, and the acronym stands for a much longer term that I don't remember, but it's like <laughs> old age survivor and something else or whatever the hell. But those OASID payouts you are not owed that, and the United States Supreme Court has said that in at least a few of their uh, decisions. So if you pay into Social Security, you are not owed anything because it was a tax in the first place. So you get paid anything out of just a welfare handout. So when this article mentions about these uh, government so-called programs that are socialist in nature and 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 – I think they mentioned something too about fire departments and highways and oh, just yeah. other stuff. The roads. I mean, <laughs> oh God, the roads. Yeah, and, and, and completely oh, neglecting man. the fact that Dr. Walter Block actually wrote an entire book about privatizing the roads. <laughs> so it, I mean, th this is just pathetic. And this is before we get into silly, um, you know, wannabe universal uh, medical coercive medical insurance stuff like Medicare, or Medicaid, or, or even Obamacare. Yep. Indeed, indeed. And, and yeah, that like it's like, oh, yeah, these programs are socialist in nature. They've existed forever, so they're a good thing. And this is this is something I want to point out here, too, is that, I mean, social security is something that like even uh, like even like the, the right wing, like the, the I guess the right wing elderly folks or I guess people like my dad's age and older, my, my, my aunt's age, she's in her 60s. Uh, yeah, like they, they're completely fine with with social security, even though it is a it's socialist insecurity, as, as, yeah, as your article is titled. But hold on a minute. The reason that is is because they have a vested interest, especially when you look at lobbies like the AARP. So much like much like when you have a vested special interest like the RIAA does in enforcing copyright or intellectual property laws, similarly, the AARP has a vested special interest in making sure that the socialized retirement known in America as Social Security keeps on going. And that's, and that's not even – Partisan. That is like, you know, there was a there was a famous quote about the worst actions of government are all bipartisan, and and the socialized retirement is bipartisan, even though originally its roots were in, um, you know, basically these kind of authoritarian so-called progressives who are, if anybody's being really honest, they're more like regressives, as in regressing us towards tyranny. Mm -hmm. But that's just kind of what it is. So of course you're going to have people who are going to claim to be uh, so-called conservatives support socialized retirement because they have a vested special interest in doing so. That's why. Definitely, definitely. And it, 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 there's, there's obviously, a, and actually a lot of people don't, like I guess a lot of the elderly folks don't actually realize the implications of, of Social Security. They don't actually realize they're stealing from from their working children right now. Oh, and uh, the best part, and the best part is the, OS, the OASDI actually publishes uh, the trustee reports annually, and having read the most recent ones, they're saying, not anybody else, so this is from the government's own documents, they're saying the, uh, the, OS, the OASDI uh, trust fund, so-called, is going to be go bankrupt in sometime during the 2030s. They actually kind of disagree as to which year, but yeah, it's going to be in the 2030s. So by 2040, it's gone, unless they can somehow fix it, which I doubt they will. Yeah, you hear that, millennials? I mean, this this article is all about millennials. Uh, yeah, you aren't gonna get shit. You're paying into something, and you're not gonna see a penny of it. Uh, so yeah, there's your there's your socialist program. Uh, have fun with that one. Uh, but let's let's go ahead and move forward here. This next session, next this next section's titled uh, "The Millennial Generation's Model for Socialism is Scandinavia, Not the USSR." Bernie Sanders has repeatedly brought up Scandinavia in his speeches, and this has drawn an enormous amount of millennial supports. The Nordic countries, including Denmark, Sweden, and Iceland, follow a system called the Nordic model, which successfully combines Western free market capitalism with a large welfare, large welfare state. This creates a sort of third-way policy between both systems. 
Millennials who are known for their concern for social issues, online social activism, and research into issues they care about see the Scandinavian countries as representing many of the aspirations they are concerned about. While Nordic countries possess high taxes, millennials are intrigued by Scandinavia's social safety nets, low poverty rate, universal health care, and free education to citizens. Jesus Christ, God, where do we start? I think the, fir the first place I want to go to here is combines Western free market capitalism with a large welfare state. And I, I put this up as the quote of the month from May, uh, what I'm about to read you guys. Because I've gotten in, like I, I've I've gotten into Bates people on fascist book. Uh, it's even been brought up in my higher level indoctrination. It's in one of the editions where my professor thought like the the like the the perfect system was a perfect like the the ideal blend of of uh, free market capitalism with communism. Uh, Ludwig von Mises discussed this in Human Action. It's actually page two fifty nine. Quote. The market economy, or capitalist as it is usually called, and the socialist economy preclude one another. There is no mixture of the two systems possible or thinkable. There is no such thing as a mixed economy, a system that would be in part capitalistic and in part socialist. Production is directed either by the market or by the decrees of a production czar or a committee of production czars." End quote. And that's like, when I found that when I found that quote when I was reading Human Action, it was fantastic. It, I, I've been looking for something like that for the longest time. Uh, there's no such thing as a blend between these two things. This article is completely wrong, and uh, <clears throat> I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, how many uh, how many millennials study economics in their safe spaces, Kyle? <laughs> Well, though they they probably don't, but I wouldn't just leave it to that. Um, obviously, without naming any names, at least at the, uh, at least at this time, you know there are those even in the uh, patriot community who obviously think that you can blend uh, uh, free markets with uh, some sort of central planning. Although to be perfectly sure, yeah. fair, although although with one caveat, although to be perfectly fair, the patriots generally speaking don't like the welfare state. But they do like protectionism. They do like mercantilism. At least some of them do. Uh, some of them even like uh, Alexander Hamilton and everything that he stood for, the American School of Economics, which had the three uh, points on his platform of high tariffs, uh, corporate business subsidies, and, of course, my personal favorite, the National Bank, which then, of course, was formed the basis for basically central banking itself. Oh, and all the associated horrors associated with that – uh, particular, uh, you know, school of economics known as the American School. So there you go. That's what happens when you have your blending of the free market with some sort of authoritarian central planning. You get Alexander Hamilton and his bullcrap. Yeah, that that is true, and 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 I think Molyneux pointed this out a few years ago before he went all cuckoo. But um, <laughs> <laughs> to to put it nicely, uh, but but yeah, like even with uh, even with like the the most limited government, like once you once you give them access to taxation and tariffs and all of that, all of that sort of thing, uh, government expands and they start robbing from the free market. So the, this 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 ridiculous notion that uh, we'll r restore the constitution. Uh, everything will be all uh, jolly and jolly and good again. Uh, no, that's 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 not how it works. History has shown that there's enough empirical evidence to prove that uh, uh, to to at least prove uh, at least prove that in part. Uh, so yeah, this this notion of blending the two, uh, yeah, it, it's one or the other. I, I don't like uh, I don't like dualism and things like that. But uh, in this instance, yes, you either have the free market, as Mises as Mises said, you either have the free market or you have uh, you have central you have central planning. Yeah, one, one more thing about that, too, just as more of a historical note. The basis for the Whiskey Rebellion was actually directly caused, not just correlated, it was directly caused by Alexander Hamilton because in the report on the public credit, which was issued to the House of Representatives, I believe it was in 1790, uh, Alexander Hamilton said that in order to pay down the interest, not just the, the principal was being paid differently, but just paying down just the interest on the war debt, the way to pay down the interest was to issue a tax on distilled spirits, which would include whiskey. And remember, there was a good chunk of those uh, distillers uh, at that time who actually were Revolutionary War veterans. So if you can think about it, the federal government has had a very long history of treating its own veterans very <laughs> badly, even going back as far as the early American Republic, with General Washington, first president of the United States, getting on that horse and personally leading the troops to crush the whiskey rebels who themselves are Revolutionary War veterans just trying to get back on their feet after the war. And so, when you socialize, so when you socialize the war debt, 
uh, like how you and I wrote about in that one article. Uh, you know, this is just what happens. You cannot blend. Mises was right. You cannot blend freedom with tyranny because that's what we're really talking about here. Yep, that is true. And, and for reference here, if any of you guys are interested in checking out, or checking out that article, don't have a tiny URL for it, but uh, it's called Jumping the Minarchist Ship. Uh, how and why America came to be. If you just search "jumping the Minarchist ship," you'll you'll be able to pull it up on the website. Uh, but but yeah, that's some some very uh, very good points there. Uh, so let's see. Uh, what's in this next paragraph? Uh, so I mean, the, the, obviously another violation of self ownership, a violation of argumentation ethics, performative contradictions, and all that good stuff. But uh, uh, millennials are in favor of, of of high like they're in favor of the high taxes and the uh, social safety net. Uh, low poverty rate, uh, the low poverty rate, uh, universal health care, and free education to citizens. Uh, now, now this is, <clears throat> I think this is, I, I, I didn't put this in that uh, in, in the most recent article uh, in the uh, Adventures on, in Illinois Higher Education series, but I think that's mostly, I think it really comes down to Kyle is this this actually I guess I did talk about this the desire for, like I, I guess the desire for free stuff. Um, they 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 understand, and I I understand as well the the student debt, uh, and and all of the bad things that 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 comes with that. I mean, being a slave until you pay those off essentially, um, with particularly particularly high interest too. Uh, I think this the, this kind of boils down to just the the free stuff and a lack of ba a lack of understanding of even basic economics. Uh, free healthcare, free this, free that. Uh, that's that's kind of the. I think that's kind of what's drawing the millennials in. Uh, would you say that might be accurate? I think the temptation of welfare state handouts can really corrupt really anybody of any age, of any uh, demographic conceivable, whether, you know, based on skin color or, you know, what's between your legs or anything else. I mean, hell, you promise any human being uh, other people's property, uh, yeah, that's going to tempt people at the very least, and a good chunk of people, unfortunately, are going to, if it's a sincere offer, they're going to take up on uh, on uh, basically outsourcing the risk of stealing other people's property. They're going to outsource that to the state if they can get away with it legally. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean that's just kind of what it is. In much the same way that the military serves as a way for outsourcing the dangers of people, you know, personally taking up arms and uh, shooting foreigners. Instead, you're like, oh, well, we'll just have the military deal with that. You get to be comfy right at home when, you know, when the Pakistanis have their weddings drone bombed and all of that. Also, notice too, I don't think anywhere in this article it mentions about the millennials being anti-war. Yeah, and no, I'm not. I, I I would say that they probably are for the. I, I, they probably are. And obviously the the anti Trump kind of, the anti Trump thing then mentioned him again. Damn it! I I really I really despise bringing <laughs> him up because he's all he's all over everywhere at all times. Uh, but uh, like the the pretty much the the anti Trump thing is essentially like uh, I mean I, I would say that most millennials are leftists or uh, they're for like uh, obviously helping out the Syrian refugees, um, and uh, they don't like the the racism attached with that. So I I, don't, I honestly don't know that that'd be an interesting question if I if I could if if, if anyone knows um, if the millennials are actually anti-war. I, I would I would think that they probably are. Uh, but, don't make uh, don't make don't make don't make assumptions though. I mean, what I'm saying is that in this article, <laughs> at least so far, it hasn't come up yet. So I mean, that's kind of an open question, isn't it? Are the millennials anti-war or not? I know I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I I know I am too. And I, just one more point in that in that last section. Uh, millennials research into issues they care about. Uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure the issues they're they're looking into are Bernie Sanders. Uh, and probably Scandinavia too, since that was mentioned. But I would also posit that uh, uh, they're probably not looking into uh, Austrian economics. They're probably not looking into uh, the dangers of the state. They're probably not looking into the history of uh, socialism and, and authoritarian regimes that have literally wrecked person and property. Um, I mean, democide. Uh, we've, we've talked about that enough. Well, they're probably not. Well, they're probably not even looking into real systematic grievances either. I mean, I can express grievances with the best of them. I mean, hell, <laughs> are millennials really talking about civil asset forfeiture? How about nuisance abatement? Dragnet wiretapping? Maybe they'll talk about that one whenever they get uppity about the NSA, but that was like an old thing from like, what was it, two, three years ago, something like that? Who cares about Ed Snowden now? At least according to millennials, because he's not on the news cycle. Yep, yep, indeed, indeed. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I, I, I'm pretty sure what they're researching uh, or what, what they care about isn't uh, actually it doesn't actually pertain to freedom or liberty and anything like that. So, um, next section: Democratic socialism directly appeals to millennial concerns. Millennials don't trust the political establishment. Join the club. So it took long <laughs> enough. Uh, this means that a candidate like Bernie Sanders, who although caucusing in the D Democratic Party, is actually the longest-serving independent congressman in the United States, holds tremendous appeal for them. Much of Sanders' unforeseen success in the primary has been from targeting millennial voters, a group among whom almost 50% identify as independents. As the most diverse generation so far, the Visa Millennials are very much in line with the Sanders campaign messaging. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything like, yeah, don't, yeah, you don't trust the political establishment. Well, just, just wait, Bernie supporters. You're going to get railroaded real hard by it. Uh, like the Ron Paul voters in 2012, you're going to get shoved out and shit on. And, uh, when that happens, feel free to cancel your voter registration, tinyurl.com forward slash cancel voter. Uh, yeah, cause that's, uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, that's definitely what's going to happen. Uh, cause it's, it's going to be Hillary, it's good, uh, especially after, uh, the past couple of days activities. Uh, it's probably going to be Trump and Hillary, I, I, I would say. Uh, so yeah, you're going to get screwed by the system, even though you don't trust it. If you don't trust it, why are you, why are you participating in it in the first place? Uh, <laughs> Kyle, any thoughts there before we move forward? Yeah, I was actually looking something up when, when you were mentioning a little bit ago, and I was trying to find this old study that was done at least, I think this was, yeah, this was back in March of 2014. So that was actually right before the Bundy affair took place in April. And this was a study that was actually done by the Pew Research Center, if you remember those guys. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had a uh, headline read, six new findings about millennials. And one of those was uh, millennials have fewer attachments to traditional political and religious institutions. So I, I guess that kind of coincides with, uh, <laughs> with what the other guy's saying about uh, millennials don't trust the political establishment. Well, I mean, a Pew Research Center find it out. It must be true, supposedly. Yeah, and and that's actually mentioned there too. I, the yeah, the the religious detached like the 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 um, not uh, believing in traditional religion and, and things of that nature. So yeah, that's uh, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of been the trend, and I I would say that's that's probably accurate. Um, let's see here. The bottom line. Oh, this is this is his summary. Though socialism is a word that brings up bad associations for many of us, the connection that millennials have with it is entirely different. The ideas inherent in democratic socialism regarding inequality, health care, and higher education echo the ideals of millennials. President Obama's successful courting of millennial voters played a huge role in the 2012 election. Today, conversation about socialism is confused by generational differences, with each generation having contradictory understandings of the concept. Now that a sizable portion of millennials are embracing socialism, or at the very least a democratic socialist presidential candidate, it's important to understand what exactly they're advocating for so we can better understand what issues they care about. Oh, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see how there can be contradictory <clears throat> understandings of, of socialism. Socialism, by definition, is anti propertarian They really, really don't like private property. That's why it's not even about money, really. The money is just a consequence of having um, or, or at work you know, at best a correlation with the private property. It's really the private property they despise, always have, always will. Um, and, you know, actually it was funny, you know, Milton Friedman was in a documentary once and he was kind of uh, recollecting like some sort of conference that he and Ludwig von Mises and like some other people were at. And at one point Mises got, and this is according to Friedman, Mises got so upset that he actually stood up, yelled out the following before he left the room and marched out like a boss. Uh, you're all a bunch of socialists. <laughs> that is fantastic. So yeah, Mises called out the Chicago boys for, uh, and I agree with him, much in the same way Sam Conkin agreed with Mises, that yeah, the Chicago boys and all these other efficiency experts for the state are pretty much just socialists. Uh, even if they're not, you know, commies in the, in the traditional sense, they're still very much central planning. That does not change. There is the central planning. There is the rules and regulations that we always hear from the unconstitutional fourth <laughs> branch of government known as the administrative agencies uh, and, and so forth. That does not change. The welfare state does not change. Now, it even goes so far as to say the military itself might as well be one more welfare handout. I mean, think about it. You have all yep. these military. You have all these mil Lou Rockwell wrote a great article years ago that basically explained how these military base, especially the ones domestically here, 
or a kind of welfare program, especially when you see how they actually ruin like middle class suburban communities and turn them into red light districts. So even people who are Christians should not support the military because when the military base comes to your town, you better pack up and leave unless you're unless you want to live in a red light district. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, I guess what some of these people had. This won't make a lot of people happy, but yeah, that's why I call them welfare warriors. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for what's that worth? For for what for, for whatever that's worth. Uh, so yeah, we, we we covered that article, and obviously you can you can you can see why we wanted to cover that. It's it's pretty atrocious, and there's a lot of uh, misconceptions, even though they're trying to point out misconceptions, a lot of contradictions, even though they're trying to uh, <laughs> negate the contradictions. Uh, so yeah, that that was the the first article, and just to give you a, another idea of, of what's on this site, we we decided to do a second article here. This one won't take as long. Uh, yeah, this is just one of the ones we chose. We we don't want to talk about the the generational bathrooms. I, I'm staying away from that topic. Don't care. Whatever. Um, so this article is titled "How are How are the birth control methods of millennial women changing?" Uh, so this is this is obviously important. This is important. Uh, it definitely uh, pertains to uh, life, liberty, and property. So. So I'll read this first paragraph, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll discuss Kyle. Uh, quote: Youth and sexuality have always gone hand in hand. Darn those horny teenagers! And millennials are no exception when it comes to a generation seemingly obsessed with it. But with her general distrust of institutions and lack of religion, one might be inclined to think that millennials would be popping out kids left and right, or swarming with STIs and STDs. But in fact, it looks like millennials are the most pro-sexual health generation yet. Strong-minded, socially liberal, and willing to argue for causes they believe in, millennials have made it clear that they support sex education in schools and believe that contraceptives should be easily available. Well, <laughs> just from just from my 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 experiences uh, on fascist book and knowing people personally, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, millennials popping out kids probably increased quite a bit. Uh, it seems like every single day there's a new uh, there's a new millennial pregnant. Uh, so I'm not I'm not quite sure about that. And I'm not actually not quite sure. I mentioned this to you before we did this, Kyle. Um, but uh, uh, not swarming with STIs and STDs. Uh, well, the college I go to, Illinois State University, uh, it's one out of three or one out of four. I don't remember exactly either one's bad enough. But one out of three or one out of every four women uh, that you see on campus have STDs. Uh, so I'm not sure that's, uh, I, I really don't think that's better than uh, previous generations, to be completely honest. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really don't. Uh, and I want their viewpoint on contraceptives, yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they, they want that to be covered, they want it to be socialized, that's what they, as, uh, as they do with most everything else. Um, but, uh, well, yeah, notice how, well, notice how, well, well, notice how the author mentioned about, he believe, or the, the millennials <laughs> allegedly believe that contraceptives should be easily available. Well, that's wonderfully vague, isn't it? What does should be easily available even mean as a phrase? Is he talking about handing them out like candy? Is he talking about trying to have, I don't know, competitive pricing to the point where, you know, through the price system at the free market, uh, the costs are brought down so uh, even people who are kind of strapped for cash can, you know, get a rubber, as it were? I mean, what does it mean should be easily available? That could mean anything. So, yeah. you know, the, the lack of precision in language is actually a problem because it allows people who otherwise would <laughs> rightfully disagree about something because they have two very different ways of looking at it, even at times contradictory, end up actually seemingly agreeing on something because of the lack of specificity. In much the same way that Donald Trump's political platform, if you could put it like that, is wonderfully vague, except for, of course, one or two things that people get riled up about. But generally speaking, you ask me what Donald Trump wants to do, I can't tell you. With Bernie Sanders, as much as I despise the man, I can at least tell you what he wants. Oh, yeah. Because, because he's been very specific. It's the only nice thing I will ever say about Bernie Sanders ever, is that I can tell you exactly what he wants to do if you give him you know, access to the, the Ring of Mordor, as it were, also known as the Oval Office. Uh, you know, with Donald Trump, I, I can't tell you. So, I mean, this is a Donald Trump sentence. It's it's just kind of like a flashy phrase, like, make America great again. Well, what does that mean? Make America great again might as well make, be the same thing as making contraceptives should be easily available. It's just these vague slogan-like generalities that that don't have carry any meaning. And the worst part of it, Shane, is that you can have slogans and mottos that actually have <clears throat> meaning uh, but the problem is that the way that the words are being used here and in the context they are, there's nothing 
it's kind of like that old cartoon. There's nothing there there. It's yeah. just it's just empty, valid, shallow, and obtuse. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's definitely true. So uh, I guess a, a question uh, that just kind of popped up: do Do you think the the vagueness is there for a purpose? Or, or do you think the author is just, uh, I don't know, uh, well, I guess just not being specific, just uh, out of ignorance or, or what? Do you, do you think there's a, a purpose for, for the vagueness? You know, Edward Bernays wrote in his book, literally titled Propaganda. He very, very literally wrote the book on propaganda. He mentioned that there are things that have to be done in order to shape the what, they, what he called the public mind. And, and he even said that it was the job of social engineers and marketing ad men who comprise the invisible government, his words, to basically craft people's minds and mold them like, uh, like how actually another authoritarian said, need them on the, on, on, like, like people, like children's brains or like, like a, a dough, like on a putty board or something, kneading them and shaping them and all that. So when, when people use when a lot of these so-called thought leaders or pundits or whatever use certain terms, um, you could be right. It might just be by accident, and sometimes that does happen. But what can't be ruled out is when it's done deliberately. I don't know about this particular author, but look, either way you look at it, if he, the guy's a useful idiot or if he's controlled opposition, it's bad either way. And again, that's why the only real way to deal with this is to have, at least I think, is to have a specificity in language. Otherwise, you're going to be at some point dealing with, even when you do get to something specific, a lot of these guys will commit verbicide. I mean, look at the word liberal. Look at the word gay. If you and I are going to be talking about gay liberal, if we're going to combine the two, if we're going to talk about gay liberals, well, we could be talking about somebody who's a happy libertarian. <laughs> or we could be talking about somebody who is a uh, basically a homosexual uh, socialist. Yeah, but sure. uh, but, uh, but, uh, but you know, as you can see, those are noticeably different things from the from like if you were to combine two very controversial words, gay and liberal. So, you know, specific, specificity of language, what words mean, the actual definitions are very very important. But you can't even get that far if you if you're going to make America great again by having contraceptives be easily available. Yep, yep, very very true, very true. Well, well said, well said. Um, so millennials believe in contraception. We're back to this. Uh, well, actually, that's what the articles, that's pretty much what the article is about, so I can't be surprised. <laughs> Quote, Although this should come as no as a surprise to no one, millennials believe fully in contraception, with 71% saying that its use is morally acceptable. Even among young Catholics, a de denomination which officially condemns contraceptive use and argues for natural family planning, contraceptives are not seen as evil, with 72% of white Catholic millennials and 68% of Hispanic Catholic millennials saying that it's morally acceptable. A strong majority of millennials strongly believe that birth control should be accessible to everyone and don't see religious and or moral beliefs as being a valid reason for health plans to not cover birth control. So, yeah, it brought up uh, Catholicism, Kyle. I used to be a Catholic. What are, what are your thoughts on this part? Well, yeah, so I was raised as, uh, as some people would say, a medieval Catholicism, you know, the mass being <clears throat> said in Latin, you know, mea copa, mea copa, mea mox, mea copa, and, and all of that. Um... But it's kind of interesting what the author is basically saying here. He's basically claiming that Catholic millennials are a bunch of hypocrites. That's what he's actually saying. Um, that's probably true, uh, especially when you consider, you know, hormones and teenagers and even not necessarily that, but, you know, good old-fashioned, you know, libido, even for people in, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, uh, you know whatever, you know, age bracket you're in, I suppose. But again, notice the, the vagueness in the language when it, about uh, the birth control should be accessible to everyone. Again, he, look, the first task of philosophy is to call things what they are. I don't know. What does this mean should be accessible to everyone? What does that mean? It's not being defined here. Again, vague generality. Yep, yep, that is uh, that is definitely true. That is definitely true. I've got nothing to add there, but just, uh, I guess, some interesting statistics. And I'm not sure. Morally acceptable. Huh. Uh, you know, I, I when it comes to when it comes to abortion and birth control and things, I, I I'm not really sure. Like as far as as far as uh, I guess libertarian ethics go, I don't think that's even in the realm of of thing. That that's that's self ownership at that point. Uh, so I, whatever. Uh, well, there was well there was a old libertarian slogan of sorts from I think back in the '80s, which is uh, yeah we're pro choice on everything, <clears throat> literally everything. And that was kind of a tongue-in-cheek way of kind of trying to validate self-ownership in a way. 
even with things that you may, you and I may personally find uh, distasteful, whether we're talking about certain types of vices or, or, or whatever, you know, each man to his own poison and so forth. Uh, you know, basically, you know, if you look at the twin axioms that, you know, that you and I abide by as well as others, you know, uh, you know, as long as those two rules are not broken, then everything else is personal choice. Indeed. Yep, that is uh, so. True. So, so when when the author's make, making making uh, the point about uh, people, <clears throat> millennials allegedly thinking that uh, use of uh, birth control is uh, ethical or or what have you, it's like, yeah, according to whose ethics are we talking? Catholicism? Are we talking Islam? How about Judaism? Hey, did everybody just forget about the Zoroastrians? Or how about the Buddhists or the Tao? I mean, you see where I'm going with this. I mean. Yep. It's, it's like, whose ethics are we talking about here? Again, very vague. I mean, maybe he's talking Catholic because he did use them as an example, but uh, okay. Look, last time I checked, this was a, you know, if you're going to talk in terms of demographics, last time I checked, America historically and even much of it today, if you're going to talk about religion, it's mainly Protestant because historically the Catholics were actually derided as being papists, which was a way of kind of calling them monarchists, which I'll admit is actually partially true, at least, uh, <laughs> for other reasons, right? Christ the King, the King of Kings, it was, that's part of the Catholic nomenclature, always has been, probably always will be. But yeah, Catholics came here and they were thrusted in Maryland, which was got the name Mary, Maryland, Mary's land, as in St. Mary, the mother of Christ, and so forth. So um, yeah, not quite sure where he's going with that. Uh, but as you can see, I mean, I, I mean, you can try and think this through, like, what did this guy possibly mean? But at that point, it's just speculation, to be perfectly honest. So I don't know yeah. what he's talking about. It's just he's not defining anything as kind of these vague generalities and whose ethics we're talking about here. It, it, it opens more doors than it answers, unfortunately. Yep. Yep, that is true. And, and, and obviously, uh, th this has been pointed out before, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it real brief. But uh, obviously, like uh, socialists, progressives, whatever whatever the hell label you want to toss on them, they're socialists. But um, they always, uh, like, they, they really, really love, like, self-ownership when it comes to, like, women and abortions and contraceptives. But when it, uh, when, when it relates to everything, no, they, they despise it. Uh, they definitely despise it. So there's uh, a contradiction there, obviously, uh, but the contradictions are literally endless when you get into contradictory ideologies. So uh, with that, so let's uh, let's move forward here. Uh, which forms of birth control? So if millennials are so in support of birth control, what form of it do they use? Not hormonal therapy, evidently. Millennial women, though they value the pill's contributions to the past, don't believe in taking synthetic hormones. In fact, it looks like the future of millennial birth control may be the IUD, intrauterine device, implants, and similar long-lasting reversible contraceptives. Millennials are using these contraceptives more than any generation before them, which makes sense. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip forward past that part, because that's just talking about the actual application of it. I just don't think there's nothing in there. Uh, say yes to sex ed. Millennials value the implementation of sexual education in the classroom, and they believe that the, this education should be comprehensive and accurate. Surveys show that nearly one quarter of millennials received no form of sex ed. However, even among the majority who did receive it, only 39% say that it was very accurate, with 51% describing the information they were taught as somewhat accurate. When it comes to sexual safety, very and somewhat are not the terms one wants to hear. 75% of millennials support sexual education in middle and high school and believe that comprehensive sex ed is the key to avoiding STI proliferation and or unwanted teen pregnancies. This is a big issue considering estimates say that one in two sexually active adults will have a strong likelihood of contracting STI. So, I mean, yeah, they're obviously fine with, I mean, they're fine with public schooling, obviously, uh, which is obviously a problem, which I know you're very keen on, Kyle. Um, but uh, I mean, yeah. What else is to say about this? What are your thoughts? Well, this is this is kind of really stupid in a lot of ways. And sorry, it just made me think of my late mother when I was a teenager, and I basically pretty much right at the beginning when I right when I started actually flirting with with girls my own age at that time. Uh, I remember, you know, mom kind of noticed that, and so she set, she uh, sat me down and. Uh, I kind of knew how things worked mainly as far as that kind of stuff goes, but she sat down and we had the, the birds and the bees talk basically. And she was very, you know, she was a proper Catholic woman, but she was going to be very honest with me for this one time regarding this one subject. And <laughs> it was never brought up again, but I thought about it, I was like, you know what, I think I had, you know, a halfway decent sex ed and then everything else, you know, being a libertarian at the time, although I didn't know what, what it meant. 
Um, of course, you know, you know, there there is such a thing as you know the internet. And I don't want to get too graphic here, but there are certain <laughs> things you can learn, both medically and uh, <clears throat> recreationally, that can assist you. And unfortunately, there are a lot of myths and things like that. But there's also a lot of accurate information. You have to kind of you know, hopefully use that big brain of yours and not your little brain in in terms of trying to figure that out. Having said that. <laughs> You know, having said that, um, this whole notion about like the government schools need to provide sex ed, which is what I think the author here is getting at, mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. I mean, the schools are not, excuse me, not schools, the indoctrination centers are not teaching the hapless captive pupils things that they should know about, arguably, just to have, I mean, to hell with getting a job. How about a liberal arts education? Let's start there. Uh, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, three R's. They're not even doing that. So if they're not even doing that, why would you expect them to do what their parents should have been doing in terms of having the birds and the bees talk? Indeed, indeed. Just to provide some clarification here. Uh, the uh, that's the the quadrivium is the the second liberal arts. It's the the add on to the trivium. We're not talking about women's studies or gender studies or anything like that. Like this is the the classic liberal arts. Uh, it's it's been demis it's 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 been not demicited it's been verbicided <laughs> <laughs> it's been verbicided like uh, a lot of other terms uh, which we've covered already so yes the the original liberal arts the quadrivium uh, so yeah you you you've, that's a definitely a, a good observation I, I don't know why anyone would trust uh, these people to teach their kids about like one of the most intimate things that could happen in their lives uh, so yeah I think that's that's definitely not a good thing in the least bit. All right, and uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this article up. The bottom line, oh, this is a good, this is a fun part. Although four in ten millennials say that sex ed they received back in high school or junior high was not helpful to them, it's important to note that many of them took part in abstinence-only sex ed programs, which explains why such a massive contingent still supports the idea of comprehensive sex ed programs. That said, concerning the fact that teen pregnancy rates have hit an all-time low among millennials, it stands to reason that at least having sex ed, whether quality sex ed or not, has been beneficial to them. One thing is for sure, millennials care a great deal about practicing safer sex and about ensuring that younger generations have greater access to contraceptives. Concerning the popularity of their stances in such details as the fact that IUDs are now going to be more affordable than ever before, it sounds like they're most likely going to get their wish for a future that is less restrictive when it comes to sex ed and birth control options. You know, I, I have a problem with, 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 with that statistic again. Uh, teen pregnancy rates have hit all, an all-time low among millennials. I don't think so. I, I don't think that's actually true. And, and obviously, after we get done with this, I'll, I'll follow up on the, on, on the link. Um, but, yeah, I just don't see that to be the case. Just from, from my experiences with people here in my own town, uh, it seems like it definitely seems like it's increasing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm still not sure about that statistic. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you and your skepticism. You know, I hate to admit this, but it happened. You know, I actually took some women's study courses in college, <clears throat> you know, back in the day, as it were. And I remember the professor mentioning the increasing teen pregnancy rates among millennials specifically. So somebody's wrong here. So was it my feminist professor? Is it this guy? Maybe both of them are wrong, and the truth is a third option. I don't know, but somebody's wrong here. Yep, A cannot be A cannot be B. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah, I, and that that's kind of what I the the information that I that I have too. I I, I don't think that's accurate in the least bit. Uh, but yeah, more affordable than ever before with contraceptives. Yeah, that's highly socialized. Government's taking over healthcare now. Um, so. Yeah, well, as far as well, hold on. As far as the affordability goes, you know, if the free market was actually allowed to operate, uh, you know, a spontaneous order, uh, with you know, without that central planning, and especially creative destruction, which is why you have such a permeability in the free market with like you know businesses rising up and then you know also kind of merging with others or even or even going bankrupt at times and all that. If you have the free market just be able to function, that would also make uh, your various birth control products more affordable as well, including also, you know, the R&D that goes into developing uh, more developed versions of all of those. Because remember that if anybody who studied the history of the pill, the original one back, I think it was in the 50s, I believe it was, 
uh, there was quite a bit of R and D money that had to be sunk into that. Oh yeah. So I mean, that too can can make you know as the technology, the medical technology is developed, uh, you know that can also make it more affordable too. But I don't think that's what's happening here. Correct me if I'm wrong, Shane. I think what's happening here is there's very much a socialization of the of medicine. And, and placing it on the backs of the poor sap taxpayers. And of course, the whole point of borrowing into infinity is placing the burden on the unborn uh, next generation, starting with, to some degree, with Generation Z, which is after you and I, and then, and then their kids, and then from that point onward. And, you know, the Iroquois people had a very good saying, and I'm going to try and do it justice here, but they more or less said some of the effect, if you have to consider your actions in the present as to what its effects are going to be upon the next seven generations. Mm -hmm. So if the Iroquois were slightly had any amount of wisdom whatsoever, and I assume they would, you know, just like pretty much any uh, human people that have existed uh, throughout, throughout history of this particular, you know, <laughs> small pale blue dot, as it were, that's floating in space. Um, I, I would assume they would at least, I would like to think they got that one right, at least in part. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's the, especially the problem with things like Social Security is that they're, they're not even thinking about the next generation ahead. They're, these people aren't. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's definitely a problem. It's going to lead to some, some bad results. As, I mean, recent history, like Greece and Venezuela, we, we, we've seen these, uh, these sort of systems just collapse and uh, leave people uh, fucked for their basic necessities, like Venezuela. Like they, they can't even provide uh, since the the government took over production of food, or I guess distri production, distribution, whatever, uh, distribution, production or distribution of food. Uh, yeah, people like bread lines, bread lines. Uh, this stuff is extremely dangerous, and uh, people don't actually understand the implications of, of what they're advocating for, and that's definitely uh, uh, definitely a problem. And, uh, uh, and if that's the case, and if that's the case, it really kind of does beg the question, who are really the savages here? Who's really being civilized? So you have some people who want all this uh, government socialization of pick whatever it is out of the air, and then you had uh, some of the uh, native indigenous peoples of wherever make statements. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, the Iroquois, there was also uh, the Iroquois Constitution, too where they were trying to unite their people as, as best as they could, at least in some sort of like stable, like compact of sorts and all that. So, you know, it kind of begs the question, who really are the ruthless, merciless savages here? You know, I mean, yep. if you have one people talking about, you know, let's consider our actions on the next seven generations, then you have this other bunch of people here who, and I don't want to sound like Stefan Molyneux too much, but basically are a bunch of our selected uh, rabbits who basically uh, are rather promiscuous and uh, do have low investment uh, parenting in their offspring and uh, get killed off quite easily. Uh, if that's the uh, if there's any sort of uh, legitimacy to epigenetics, then you know who's again who's really being the savages here? Who's actually being civilized? I think the audience is smart enough to figure that out. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, <laughs> that is uh, definitely true. Uh, so we, we've gone through both of those articles. Uh, uh, Kyle, I guess any any uh, closing thoughts on on these two articles uh, or anything we, we've discussed thus far? I don't think it's necessarily fair to try and collectivize an entire generation of people on a certain portion of, of one continent and then by claiming that they have a certain set of shared characteristics. And you know for people who are interested, I really encourage them to watch that debate back in the 1980s that Sam Konkin had with Robert Poole because Sam Konkin addressed even this point, at least in passing, about I think it was the yuppies I think he was referring to, uh, where he was trying to rebut something Robert Poole had mentioned about the yuppies being, uh, having, possessing a certain set of characteristics and Konkin's like, maybe there's some certain transitory characteristics in passing, but quite frankly, I just don't see it. And in much the same way Konkin said that about the yuppies, I say the same thing about the millennials being one myself. I don't really see any sort of cons really all that much consistent uh, collective trends. I mean, last time I checked, Shane, you and I are individuals. Yes, and yes, there are going to be and there are going to be some millennials who are going to be fascists. Some of them are going to be socialists. Some of them are going to be uh, something else. Hell, a few might even be libertarians here and there. But the point is that you're going to have this kind of variation. 
and trying to make these claims, these broad sweeping generalizations that uh, millennials are this way, that way, or whatever, again, at best, like Honkin said, transitory characteristics in passing at best, but anything solid you can really point to, eh, this is the problem with some of the social science research. Some of it stretches out a little bit too far. Yep, yep, that is uh, that is definitely true, but it's not something we should be surprised by by any sense of the imagination because uh, obviously they're collectivistic, so uh, a lot of their studies and research are going to be collectivistic as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Kyle, thank you so much for uh, for coming on and doing this with me. It was a, f a fun discussion. It was purely off the cuff for, for you guys uh, watching or listening. Uh, so, yeah, we decided to do this, and, uh, and, 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 and there you have it. Uh, make sure to check out Kyle's website, thelastbestdeal.com. And, uh, yeah, we definitely hope you enjoyed this. Um, and if you did, please consider contributing financially to LUA. You can make a one-time donation using the link paypal.me forward slash LUA radio, or you can support us through Patreon. Uh, it was just revamped yesterday with terrific, uh, with some terrific rewards. So you, you support us and you get something in return. Uh, you can find that at tinyurl.com forward slash LUA Patreon. Again, that's tinyurl.com forward slash LUA Patreon. And I'm really trying to push stuff over over to Patreon since it is it is a per month thing. And obviously for, for, for I guess, obvious accounting reasons, uh, I'd love any support possible. Um, but but I definitely prefer the, the monthly donation so I know how much money there is to work with. And I'm sure you guys can understand that. Uh, so yeah, make sure to tune in every Sunday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time at fprnradio.com for the live show as well. Uh, we're going to have Jeffrey Tucker on this Sunday. That's not that's not going to happen anymore. There's a scheduling issue. Uh, not exactly sure we're gonna, that we're going to uh, be discussing uh, this Sunday, May 8th, uh, but we'll definitely keep you informed. Make sure to go like uh, facebook.com uh, forward slash LUA Truth. Uh, find us there and on all the other social media outlets. Uh, so that's all we have for you. Thanks for watching and laissez-faire.